Ladies, oh, oh, ladies and gentlemen, there's our guest for tonight. Which one is that? Eloise? Heloise? Eloise, very oh, good. Eloise, I'm getting good at uh, recognizing your cat. My cats, yes. Yeah, yeah. She just wants to keep her tail in the picture, that's all. And the t they have more tail. <laughs> they always know when something's, uh, you know, facing them, right? You know, when the camera's on. She yeah. does know when the camera's on. Yeah. How you doing today, Will Durst? I'm good. How's it going, Alex Bennett? Uh, I've been going through a little uh, sicky thing. It, I think it's a, a, I went to the doctor. He thinks it's a pollen. Pollen? Yeah, it's like affecting my throat, and, you know, I have a little oh. slight feel like I have to cough. And right. you know, Keep my, the windows closed. I, I, I can't do that. You know why? Because my wife, God bless her soul, has this whole deal where she doesn't want to do that. You know? So, oh, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh. I, I uh, you know, I've, I've got. She likes to have the windows open, and I've been told if it's pollen season and you want to keep the pollen out, keep the windows fucking closed. But she that that that, that yeah, yeah yeah. So she doesn't care if I'm wheezing, if I'm dizzy, if I'm if I've got all this stuff. Like I went to the doctor. I. Uh, Went to the doctor yesterday. Uh, I went to one of these clinics, you know, one of these walk-in places the other day, uh -huh. and he tested me out, and he, he checked my heart, did an EKG, and found that there was an, something wrong with it. Well, there always is something wrong with my EKG because I have a, a bundle or something. that I have a slight some murmur. Sort of, I was, some sort of arrhythmia? A, no, arrhythmia? It, no, no, it's, it's a heart murmur, okay? It's okay. a... Uh, Steno aortic stenosis but so i went to my my other doctor yesterday and um, he's a cardiologist and he gave me an echocardiogram and said hey your, you know your aorta is a little more clogged but not you know he says if it keeps going at this rate you'll be dead of something else before and i said do you have to say that do you have to say i'll be dead he says i know it's a little morbid but you're not going to die from this aortic stenosis so he said, I can't find anything wrong with you, so it's probably the allergies. It's probably the pollen. Because supposedly pollen is just running rampant this year. Just horrible. Do you have air conditioning? Yes. I don't care unless I have the air conditioner on all the time, which isn't necessary. She wants the window open. I well... Uh, I, I'm going to have an answer. I think a divorce. Is, an I, I think a divorce so. is the answer. You know. Yes, of course, there's an obvious answer to all of this. At least it will minimize it. You know. But the pollen just keeps wafting into the house. You know. So can you make her a deal like a week on and a week off? Uh, no, no. It, 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 in this house, it's her way or the highway. Hey, I you know everything has to be done just right. The bed has to be made in a certain way. You know, I mean, quite frankly, when I wasn't married, I never made the bed. <laughs> you know, I would straighten it. I would straighten it a little bit. If and if it uh, if I got too much food on the sheets, I'd change them. You and Marilyn Monroe, apparently. Well, I used to I used to eat on the bed. I used to literally. I had a. Uh, this was in New York. I had a uh, tarp. I would throw down on top of the bed, and we'd sit there and eat on the bed. <coughs> I didn't have a dining room table. And then you would hose the top tarp off. If it got bad, we'd hose the tarp off. Yeah, and then you know. And plus, it was it was it was uh, convenient because usually I was having dinner with a date, and uh, you know there was very little places we had to go after dinner, but right under the sheets. So you know it was really cut down to the commute. When they came over, I would make the bed. Uh, yeah. yeah, and the tarp, and the and the and and I'd wash the tarp in there on. Yeah. If my wife is listening right now, she's probably going apoplectic okay <laughs> because uh, uh uh the whole idea of eating in bed that's another thing of her don't eat in bed you're gonna get crumbs in the bed i don't yeah. care i'll vacuum the bed that's what i used to do <laughs> you know when's the last time you ever vacuumed the bed 
vacuum well, the we, bed. We have popcorn in bed, and I'm always ha- I always have to get out the towel and wipe the salt out of the bed. Well, we have one of those hand vacs, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That used to do it for me. Never had this problem with other wives, just this one. <laughs> you know, and of course, yeah, they get set in their ways down the line. Also, you know what's interesting is I had asthma as a kid, and it seems like it's back again. Actually, somewhat not. Not actual asthma, but the you know being allergic to stuff. Uh, for a while, when I uh, when I moved to New York years ago, I lost all those allergies, and then when I went back to California, I didn't seem to have them. Oh. And then I came back to New York, and now I seem to be getting these allergies again. So oh. you know what the hell? A B B A. Yeah. So much about my health. How's your health? Uh, knock on wood. Not good for Micah. Everything's good so far. Yeah. Uh, I get tired faster, but... Uh, I'm tired all the time. What do you mean? I, I could always, as long as I can do in nine, stand up and do a 90-minute show, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. But if I know I'm going to do a show that night... Yeah, you have to get a nap. I can't go to the museum during the day. Oh, I see. Okay. You can't do anything that takes energy. I, I, museums are are what lose out. Well, you're yeah. you're how old now? You're nine, uh, 95, something like that. What? How old something are you? Like that. Yeah, 95 minus 20, 28. You're too, <laughs> no, you're you're 65 or something like that. Around 67, there. yeah. 67. And you're 70. Yeah, I'm 79. So you can only imagine how tired. I, older than I you am, can imagine yeah. how tired I get. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Do you take a nap every day. No, but then I do the show at night, and I do coffee, and about an hour in, it used to be, I could do the two hours standing on my head, and now a half, with an hour in, I'm, I'm starting to get dr- drowsy, so, you know. Hey, but you can sleep at night after drinking coffee? Uh, yeah, because I get drowsy. <laughs> no, sometimes I have to take something like a Xanax or a... Uh, 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 it, uh, lately, I've decided I'll take Benadryl. That that puts me to sleep, you know. No idea what any of those are. Benadryl is a decongestant, uh, antihistamine. Oh, and the, oh, and antihistamines are good because they're not going to kill you. You, could, you know, you just maybe you just dry up and turn into powder. I don't know, you know. Never oh, figured. dry up. Yeah, dry up. Yeah. So anyway, so how's how's business? Uh, you, he's a comic and he does. Uh, Comedy stuff. I do the uh, the yeah. funny comedy humor thing, yeah. and uh, get a gig. Uh, had a gig on Sunday and Father's Day. Not mm-hmm. bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wrote all this new material, and I want to unveil it at the punchline. I'm going to be at the punchline a week from tomorrow. Yeah. So uh, I'm busy rehearsing it, and I go off and uh, and I. This this is my new set, right here. Yeah, and it's only four pages, and I got most of it out on Sunday, and th- uh, I got a gig Thursday and Friday, so hopefully I can. Yeah. Well, so well, that's, it, com- that's it, every, the hard part. Every it's comedian, it's it's news. interesting. Every comedian works differently. You write it all out, right? Yeah, I need a script. You have a script. Uh, other comedians have the jokes, they know what they are, and then they just go up and start doing the act. Um, there, there are some who never write them down. No. You know? Um, Those guys have funny bones. I don't have funny well, bones. I don't know. I'm a I writer mean, who performs. Slayton has funny bones, but I've seen him with his notes. You know? He, uh, I, I, because I think it has something to do, doesn't it have something to do with remembering the joke, too? That if you just made it up and said, I'll put that in the act, and you didn't write it down, you'd forget it? Everybody's different, as you say. I I am very dependent on uh, the words. Yeah. Well, your your whole f- whole show is precise about words and the order in which they come, and so on and so forth. Yeah. 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 So you work on the punchline. The punchline's closing down, right? Man, it's such a, uh, a mish. Uh, yeah, we don't. We have no idea what uh, uh, because we've heard different things first. We heard that the landlord, which is Morgan Stanley, mm-hmm. owns the building. The landlord was going to sell 
that building and the building next to it, which used to be the old Waldorf, going to sell that and the Alcoa building, which is across that, that the whole thing was going to be sold to Google. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. uh, we had this huge NATO Green put together uh, a protest and City Steps and Aaron Peskin and Dave Chappelle came down to give it some publicity. Mm-hmm. And then Google was reached by one of the TV stations and said, we are looking forward to having the punchline as our neighbor. So then it kind of seemed that Morgan Stanley was using Google as a Judas goat so that they didn't have to take the weight. And because everybody in town here is so used to blaming Google for everything. Right. You know, just fit another thing. And. And so then Google uh, the rumor kind of said, the no, rumor, it's not the, us. The rumor and running. Morgan Stanley, uh, shut up, won't talk to anybody. And Punchline still, and Aaron Peskin put through uh, a temporary zoning restriction so that space of the Punchline can only be used for entertainment. Wow. So we have no idea what. Morgan Stanley or Google, we have no idea. I'll yeah. find out next week. Well, the rumor running around was that Google wanted to turn it into a gym for their uh, for their people. You heard that one, of course. Yeah, yeah. So it may not it may not close down then. And uh, we don't know. And the in case talking people, about the let's, beginning of August or the end of August. Yeah. All I know is August was mentioned. Let's tell people about the punchline. It's a club that's been there for how many years now? Since I think before, 1978, I think 41. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, 41 years. 1978, I got yeah. to San Francisco in uh, s- late 79, came back to San Francisco, late 79. So it was in operation when I was there, you know. So, uh, and... Uh, and it's the perfect size, you know. It's, it's a perfect 140, club. I think, after the fire restrictions. It used to be... 160, 180, but they had to take the seats along that one wall there by the front door. Yeah, because uh, the fire marshals come it's, in. It's perfect but because it's, the floor yeah. is parquet, and the walls are all brick, real brick, not yeah. phony brick, but real brick. Yeah. and then they got this beautiful mural in front, but the laughs bounce off that parquet and off the brick, and the audiences think they're having a much better time than they actually are. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah when, you, when you talk was, about about brick walls, uh, comedy clubs by law have to have a brick wall. No, it uh, works out acoustically. No, no. But what I'm but here's what I'm saying. It seems as though every club, even if it isn't a real brick wall, has a phony brick wall. Yeah, yeah. The comedy it does. Clubs. In fact, and there was a reason for it. And then they started putting up these plastic replicas. Well, no, here's balls. what happened. In, use, in uh, Florida, when I was down in Florida, there was this comedy promoter who did comedy at various venues around town during the week, and he literally had a portable brick wall that went to each of the clubs. So here we are in front of our brick wall doing comedy. Yeah, it became a signifier. I think, like, uh, I, I think that was the, uh, who was it? Uh, 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 the the uh, what's the club? The big club that was in New York and then went to L.A. Catch Rising Star? Huh? No, the other one. Uh, improv? Improv. I think because the improv on A&E did their shows, and there was a brick wall there. Everybody felt they had to have a brick wall. That's well, my, I think that's the my brick theory. wall started earlier, yeah. Yeah. Than the improv. Yeah. But anyway, the, the punchline is a is a very perfect, intimate club. Yeah. It's a civic jewel. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and it's it's continued to make money. It's not going broke, right? I don't know. All I know is I make uh, the same amount of money headlining as I did my first week there of headlining, which was 1980. When did I win the comedy competition? 83, 84. I don't Anyhow, know. I got a headlining week after I won the comedy competition. And I'm, I'm making, so 34 years later, I'm still making the same money. Well, they're probably, technically, they're paying less. Oh yeah, because the door, you know, went up from ten bucks if it was ten bucks, and now it's like twenty five. 
Yeah, but you know, most of those clubs don't actually charge at the door because they have these twofers they hand right. out around town. So that people come into the club, it's like you know, you get uh, two two tickets. Come on in for free. Now here are the drinks. They're forty bucks a piece. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. And Gold Star and Groupon and yeah. Yeah. Marketing so, is totally different. Yeah. Today. Yeah. But uh, you know, I, it, it it would be sad if the punchline went away only because <coughs> it, it just represents something. It, it yeah. And know. they've had an open mic every Sunday since 1979. Every Sunday and open night mics, folks, are important. Are important because that's where new comics go in yeah. and can learn how to be a comic. Actually, you know, have an audience that tells them you're not funny yet. You know, and then one night you go in and you get some laughs and you go, "I'm finally funny." Yeah, yeah it used to be when I got here. You were an open micer. Yeah, you were. Uh, uh, an op- an MC, mm-hmm. then you were a middle act, then you were a headliner, then you moved to LA, and that was the natural progression, which usually took two two and a half years to yeah. get through from a mi- initially starting out in the city. Yeah, yeah but you, 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 San Francisco yeah. was a way station; it wasn't a destination. You, you know what the problem uh, to me always was with that hierarchy was that some people were able to jump it, and here's how they did it. If you were a certain kind of act, nobody wanted to follow you. Nobody wanted to follow uh, an act with props. Bobcat. Yeah. Nobody wanted to follow somebody who screams. Okay. Uh, and so consequently, like something like Bob Goldthwait, he went straight to headliner. You know, where if he wasn't a screamer, he probably would have had to work his way up. Yeah, but he also came kind of fully formed from Boston. Yes, he did. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't like he had, you know, I came from Milwaukee. I wasn't getting the same kind of uh, no uh, repetition on stage that other people were getting in other cities. Chicago, you could get up every day, yeah. every night. Boston, you could get up every night. You know, I still don't understand why he went to San Francisco instead of New York. Who? Bobcat. Bobcat. Uh, I don't think New York, oddly enough wasn't a jumping off point. It wasn't a point at which you could build a reputation. It's where you went once you had one. You know? It's, I the think two right, cities yeah. the two cities that were engendering the that embracing that kind of growth that you have to have in order to be a, a, a comic were Boston, which was a hotbed of comedy and so on. Especially if you were a white male. G- gave us the likes of Bob Cat and Ke- Kevin Meany, and I'm trying to remember all the other people. Dana Gould. Dana Gould. Uh, Paula Poundstone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and uh, um, then you would, you know, San Francisco was the other city that was good this way. So if you were in Boston and you wanted to go somewhere else, you came to San Francisco. You didn't go to L.A. L.A. was where you went after you made it in San Francisco. Yeah. You know, and the only reason you went to L.A. is you wanted to be seen on stage so that maybe some TV network would see you and give you a sitcom, and then you never have to go on stage again. <laughs> really, that's what it's all about. It is. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Uh, and, and People who did not like stand-up, they just used it as a, as a conveyor belt to the big time. The biggest yeah. road warrior I know, which is Bobby Slayton, okay, who's out on the road a lot, okay, and through his life has probably logged up more air miles than anybody I know, okay. Uh, He went to L.A., and uh, he would have been very happy to get a sitcom and not have to go and do his act anymore. You know, it's just that way. Now, the only guy I know who hated doing a sitcom and was happy when it was over and went back to doing comedy in clubs and on stages across the country is Seinfeld. And you can't think of a more successful guy in television. No. You know, but he didn't like it. He didn't like the pressure. He didn't, you know, he talks about it all the time that he was, when it was over, he was happy. You know, he was also about a half a billion dollars richer, but he was happy. I don't know. I just saw What, hap- do- I what saw- happens when you get to be that rich? Uh, a lot of different pressures. Well, you can say fuck you to a lot of people. That's true. <laughs> you know. 
sure. Uh, the, f- the thing was, I saw a documentary on the last, uh, on the how Seinfeld came to be and all the stuff they had to go through. Uh-huh. And and Dave, uh, they tell about Larry David, and Larry David on the documentary admits to it that he didn't want to work that show. He thought he would do the pilot, and that would be it. It would fail, and then he could go back to whatever he was doing. You know, he didn't want to have to do that um, that whole thing. Uh, it says here, I'm getting a poor connection. Well, you're coming through okay. Anyway, uh, 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 that he didn't want it. He didn't want it. And they finally, they, they said to him, well, look, we're going to do four more. Come back and do it, and we'll make you an executive producer. <laughs> They threw him, executive producer, and now he's, of course, worth, you know, a quarter of a billion dollars. He only has, he doesn't have a half a billion dollars because his wife took half of it, you know. <laughs> uh, but the fact of the matter is, if if Larry David had had his way, he never <laughs> would have had that success. You know. No, it, the show would not have been a success. Well, it, it took the two. They needed it. all those voices in there to keep that show. Yeah. Uh, to be so unique, you know. Well, it took the, it took the two of them. Uh, in, 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 they just said they were a perfect confluence of, of uh, energy, you know, and that what they're, they're and they stood by their idea of what the show should be, you know, and not that it was a show about nothing, but that it it just was not about what other sitcoms are about. You know, there wasn't the white No, it was key. about minor irritations and and stuff that, that, you know, a whole day can turn around and everywhere that we've been. And, you know, well, you, we've, well, you we've go all... To, yeah. You, you go to a Chinese restaurant, that's an episode, yeah. you know. Uh, and, and they still... And they didn't have to have a moral at the end. It, well, yeah. They stood true to their vision, and their vision worked, you know. And... and it, in the last episode, everybody goes to jail. Yeah, and I don't think anybody's ever done that kind of show since. I think that was uh, one of a kind. Uh, they've tried to do things like it. You know, I always considered Friends the poor man Seinfeld, but it never was. It was Friends. It was a bunch of friends that hung out. So was Seinfeld, but... The difference was some of them were likable on Friends. On Seinfeld, there wasn't one person there who wasn't selfish and self-absorbed. Well, yeah. you were talking about uh, a comedian and his circle of friends, you know. Yeah. So there's they're smart, and I I never knew what Friends was about. Uh, it was about trying Except to. Except they had a great apartment. Yeah, I never watched the show. I watched one episode or tried to watch one episode, and I went, eh. This is a poor man Seinfeld, you know, and I, so I, I, I had no great love for it. I don't watch a lot of sitcoms because I feel betrayed by the laugh track. It's like them telling you when to laugh, and I hardly well, ever agree with their I, I, This is something I argue or, with girlfriend about. Or their vociferous. This is something I argue with girlfriend about. She says she doesn't like laugh tracks. And I said, well, you know, I said, you should, you should watch Big Bang Theory. And she says, well, I don't like laugh tracks. And I said, that isn't a laugh track. That's an actual live studio audience. Because they feel, and uh, uh, Chuck Glory always felt, that having a live audience, and not all the shows have a live audience now, but uh, having a live audience keeps your comedy honest. You know when it's funny when there's an audience. You don't know when it's funny when you've written it and somebody does it and you say, good performance, we hope people laugh at that. <coughs> you know. So yeah, I don't... I, don't, I, I still I, don't like the, the studio laughs then, if, even if it's not a laugh track. I don't like... I just don't like it. It makes me crawl. Yeah. Because I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to... A lot of time trying to elicit actual laughter and i know the difference yeah well i just don't like it when it's uh when it's pre-recorded laughter you know in the old days somebody would tell a joke hi bob hey look there's bob and everybody would ha, 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 ha. and you go where did that come from you know and it was the same <laughs> laugh track they did 10 minutes earlier you know yeah from i love lucy yeah, yeah. but so so it, it um you know but when it's when it, when there's a live audience there i say okay you know i'll i'll allow that 
I don't watch a lot of sitcoms. Hence. Although, Lori, what, are, what are you watching these days? You know what I just finished? I finished on Netflix, Designated Survivor. Oh, really? Yeah. With Keeper? Yeah. Uh, I liked the original show, but it wasn't that great. The new one, I think, is better than anything on Netflix, is better than anything they ever did on the network. Oh, wow. To begin with, they take advantage of the fact that they can say. Dirty language. Words. Well, let me say this, and I'm not spoiling it because I'm not telling you why. The very last word that Kiefer Sutherland says after the ten episodes is shit. <laughs> uh, it, so it's I, a ten episode. Yeah, uh, and, and it's it's really political, and what they've interspersed it with are real people talking to the camera about what they think is wrong with the country, made by documentary filmmakers. And mm -hmm. they're like sitting there and say, look at this, this is, on, uh, this is on YouTube. And then they'll play some clips. And those clips are all legitimate, real people that they went out and filmed. So I kind of like the show. I think it's, it really is a vast improvement over what they were doing on ABC. Did you watch the first two seasons on ABC? Yes, I did. I felt the second season so-so. First season, I liked the premise. Yeah. Now the premise, you know, since you can't go with that premise that the guy, in case people don't remember, what happened was he, every time the, the Congress was meeting for the State of the Union address, the president, uh, they would have one person who was a designated survivor in case something happened to the entire a member Congress. of the cabinet. Right, member of the cabinet. And he's like, I don't know. I can't remember. Secretary of Housing and Urban S Development. Something like yeah. that, yeah. And uh, they, they blow up the Capitol, and he's the only one left alive, so he's the designated survivor. Well, that worked for a couple of seasons, but what do you do now? What they did came back with was, it's now time for him to run for president. He's never been elected president, and he's not the kind of guy who knows how to run for president. And all the things that come into play, and his, his desire for honesty, and uh, the consultant who says, no, you got to do this rather than this. And it really, I think, is a pretty good, uh, pretty good show this year. Did well, they we find out, did they punish uh, the people who were responsible for the plot? I think that was in year two they found yeah. those people. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But th this one, uh, you know, it's pretty, I think it's pretty good. And politically, I love it because, you know, one episode they had, for instance, I just got finished watching, was about... Uh, a, uh, a immigrant kid who the parents came over the border because he had to get a kidney transplant and needed dialysis and they want to throw him out of the country because they came in illegally and if they do the kid will die you know so those kind of things you know yeah. and it's like uh, they kind of slam it. It, it, it let's face it Kiefer Sutherland always was the anti-Trump you know he was the president we all wish we had yeah so. hey listen We've gone well over our allotted time, and we didn't... Oh, no, no, no. I, and I, I, have, I have so much more to say. Oh, well, go ahead. To opine. Go ahead. Go ahead. We, did, we mentioned Trump once, and that was just now, when I was talking about Kiefer Sutherland's character yeah, being I'm the so anti-Trump. Yeah, I'm so tired of him. I, yeah. you know, and yeah. I think the whole country is. You know, I, can I say this? We, got, we can go over a little bit here. Fuck him. I, I don't need... I can let you run long uh, I'm beginning to believe Buttigieg is the best choice what do you and, and, what do you and, and I'll tell you why I'll tell you why I feel it's, it, it, it's it, he's the right choice is because um, I think if he were out there making his case he could win uh, you know and uh, I've listened to him and he's smart and he has ideas and he can talk foreign policy, he can talk domestic policy. I think he could run rings around Trump if he ran. And in the latest polls, he's beating Trump. Yeah, yeah. So everybody does. Uh, and he hasn't well, even five five R. He hasn't five. even gotten his full Biden, Bernie, Bernie booty booty gig, uh, uh, Harris, and uh, some, uh, uh, Elizabeth oh. Warren. Elizabeth Warren, they're yeah. all beating Trump. Yeah. yeah, they're all beating Trump. So we'll see. I'll be honest. I'd be okay with any of them except Bernie. I don't like Bernie. I don't like Bernie either. I know. We're, we're, we're going to be hated for that. People are going, yeah. oh, how can you hate Bernie? We love Bernie. What do you mean you yeah. love Bernie? I know people who know Bernie in Vermont and hate him. 
you know, and they're liberals. He's got the <laughs> sense of humor of an end table. Yeah, yeah. And I, I you know, I don't think, I don't really think he could win against Trump. I really don't. <laughs> but Buttigieg, I, I, I like him. I just like him. And I don't think the gay factor is going to be a problem. And he's young. And he's young, and, and he's got ideas, and he, he feel he'd go in running, you know, as opposed to crawling or waddling as Trump does, you know, so whatever, you know. But uh, Trump, uh, who knows? He's all for the Russians helping him, so we, <laughs> we don't know. And then the next day he said he didn't say that. Uh, yeah, even though it's on tape. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah, on tape. Yeah. Hey, insisting <laughs> that what he's saying is true. And then the next day he said he didn't say that. And then he doesn't believe the polls. Well, he the polls that came back from his internal polling said the same thing that the Fox News polls said about these other people being able to beat him. And, and that, so And then he fired his pollsters. He fired the pollsters. You know, that's uh, killing the messenger. Okay. <laughs> what the hell? Hey, listen. It's always great to talk to you. Say hello to your lovely wife. I'll talk to you in three uh, weeks. Uh, and why don't you write her a nice note and tell her to close the windows? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Will fucking Durst. That's me.